in Asia in the digital health space. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to welcome Julian. So welcome. Thank you for your uh, your attendance, your participation. It's it's a fascinating and very exciting topic, um, which um, I do spend quite a bit of time trying to share, so people understand what's happening in healthcare, and it's a uh, it's a revolution. Um, so thanks to uh, Balaji for his for eloquently setting us up really in terms of reminding us of some of the key issues that we see in healthcare, as well as of course um, um, starting to allude to some of the things that are happening in healthcare. Uh, I think he gave you a number of trends, uh, nanotechnology for example, robotics, uh, which are in themselves topics that should be covered in separate sessions such as this one. Today I'm only going to look at what was commonly called a, a digital health, but I would generally try to refer to as data-driven health. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the advent of digitization, um, mobile devices, etc., is creating a greater amount of data which we can start making a lot more sense with as far as our health is concerned. Um, who's familiar with the term digital health or data-driven health, for example? Is this something you've been reading about? Is it something you're familiar with? Just give me a show of hands quickly. Just give me a feel. Good. So I won't be teaching too many people something they already know. Okay, good. So this, this is a highly exciting topic. Um, there was far too much text on the previous slide. I'm basically healthcare. I've worked in medtech. I've worked in pharmaceutical company. I've consulted to them. I've done banking to them as well. And about three years ago, I stepped out of the corporate industry and I set up uh, Propel, which is a, uh, a small venture platform focused on seed funding of promising health tech. Um, and of course, the minute we invest, we also spend time advising in order to improve the chances of making a substantial amount of money later on when the uh, large corporate decides to acquire the little startup. Um, but it's a very exciting space. Everybody seems to think that the US is where it's all happening. It's a fair conclusion based on everything we can see, but we shouldn't underestimate what's happening in Asia. Um, there are a lot of startups in the digital health space in Asia. Um, I'm personally starting to try and do a bit of an official count of this. Um, and I think I'm on, certainly the ones I found, I found 250 so far, startups in digital health. So I'm ignoring biotech and ignoring people who are making new limbs, pacemakers, etc. It's just literally data driven healthcare solutions. So, um, healthcare is changing dramatically. Um, I think you're probably reading a lot of that in the press if you're going along and reading things. I mean, I think. The Economist launches a quarterly summary uh, on, on science uh, every three or four months. The last quarterly update, I think 80% of the articles were on healthcare revolution and what's happening in healthcare. Um, the biggest disruption that I'm seeing is in digital. And it's the same reason or rationale that we're seeing a disruption in other areas of business, such as financial services where fintech is making a big impact, for example, or commerce, largely because it's getting cheaper and cheaper to start up a business, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper to set up a solution. Usually all you need is one coder and a willing customer, and you've got a business, which in healthcare has always been an issue, because the barrier to entry in healthcare has always been one of huge cost. You saw what it cost to deliver a new drug. If you can move away from that and start creating solutions that are much, much cheaper, suddenly you get a much higher adoption from people like you and I on a day-to-day -day basis. Technology, therefore, is driving that paradigm, and it's disrupting pretty much every single arena of life that we will have uh, in front of us. So that you're parents, you start, you start thinking hard about the education focus of your children going forward. So that you're looking for a job, and you start thinking hard about what, what you're going to focus on in terms of developing as a profession. There's a lot of jobs that we know now are disappearing because of digital impact uh, and, and technology impact. It represents a fantastic opportunity for emerging markets, developing markets in Asia. Um, if markets such as Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar, which have a serious chronic issue in terms of delivering healthcare, the number of specialists per 10,000 population is woefully low. The number of hospitals with the right equipment is woefully low. If, but, the contrary to those countries is that they also have very high prevalence of disease. The highest rates of diabetes are in Asia and are in those very countries. India had a 10% prevalence of diabetes, less than 1% turn up to actually get a consultation. Gives you a flavor of the sheer time bomb, so to speak, that is occurring in those countries as far as healthcare. Uh, because diabetes is not going away. In fact, it's getting worse, because the rates of obesity are getting worse around the world. 
um, that technology will help to try and leapfrog the guy. What I mean by that is that if India, Indonesia, and Vietnam insist on trying to build a healthcare system like all the OECD countries around the world, in the same way, through the same steps, it'll take 300 years, roughly speaking, to get to the same level you've got in the UK, Australia, or in the US. They can't afford to do that, not with the population the way it is, the growth of that population and the disease in that population. That's why it represents a fantastic opportunity, we'll come back to that. Finally, the whole of that paradigm shift, which I think was described as moving away from disease treatment to wellness or prevention, means that we're starting to see some significant new opportunities uh, as it relates to new players in the market, and I'll touch upon that. The number of FTSE 500 companies focused on healthcare has gone up by some 76% in the last two, three years. It, and Google is one, for example. You've probably all read about Calico, Project X. They are investing a ton of money in the future of health. So hopefully that is something that echoes with you. It's stuff you've read, um, or certainly something else that's exciting. Um, so, what is digital health? Um, there are a number of, I guess, other words used for it. So for example, you might have heard of mHealth mobile health, uh, e-patient, quantified self. These are all terms that are banded around. They all kind of come together under the same heading, which is digital health. What is digital health? It really is this sort of conversion of the digital revolution that we're all experiencing with health. And it's driven by things such as wireless devices, sensors, um, improved battery life, etc. And I'll come back to that, but just to give you a flavor of what it is. I mean, there's a neat little diagram there you'll find um, at Nuvium, which is N-U-V-I-U-M, um, which kind of sums up all of the various elements of the ecosystem that makes up digital health. Um, it's not a new topic. So it didn't appear yesterday. Uh, the economists were writing about it back in 2009. Anyone heard of Clayton Christensen? Some of you have. So he's pretty much the godfather of innovation. He wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, for example. Um, and he coined the phrase precision medicine, which I think I actually used, back in 2008. So this is not new, so some people got ahead of the game in relation to understanding this. Um, but if you look laser? Yeah. If you look at Google searches for the word digital health, that was taken in March, late March of uh, 2015, up 103% week on week. So you can see the trend in terms of the number of people who are searching this topic. Uh, because of you know, its novelty and the fact that it appears in an awful lot of documentation that you're reading. You know, Financial Times, Economist, uh, Straight Times, etc. Um, and then, of course, there are other publications. So the Financial Times is talking about CES. Is anyone familiar with what CES is? The big Las Vegas show where all consumer electronics mm -hmm. launch their new product. It's once a year. It's the biggest festival of all consumer electronics. Well, digital health op um, startups and products uh, it is the fastest growing category of that show. Obviously, no one's interested in washing machines. They're much more interested in Apple Watch these days. Um, but also, all of the other devices behind it. So, it's, it's huge growth. The other thing is um, JP Morgan is the biggest financial conference for healthcare in, in the world. It's, it takes place once a year in the US and sponsored by JP Morgan, the big investment bank. Um, digital health didn't really feature in that. It was all about biotech and medtech. Now, digital health is about one third of the entire program of events and conferences. So it gives you an idea of what's happened in the last few years. Okay, so let's go back. Um, Balaji gave us an idea of, of healthcare and some of the trends and the issues we're seeing, etc. Uh, and I think it was an admirable way of trying to summarize what's happening. Um, to help us with that contrast or that shift, let's say, and I think insurance is a great, great question to raise because it gives you a great flavor of what that looks like. Um, so let's continue with that for a minute before we come back. Uh, let me come back to you in relation to insurance. Do you, have you bought insurance? Yeah. Uh, so give me, give me very quickly a snap summary of what that process was in terms of buying insurance. And don't, don't think about the process of buying insurance, more what information did you get asked for in relation to providing that insurance? And what to you, therefore, do you think is missing? Um, so I think, uh, I think the, well, the process was basically that my family knew someone who sold insurance. Therefore, <laughs> it was recommended to me because that was a trustworthy person, right. a family friend. 
then we had a conversation which talked very much about what kind of instruments we needed for someone who had joined the workforce. For example, if you, if the major components were if you died, if you were ill, and then there were other kind of things like saving links and financial products, the kind of, kind of split up control. Um, and my conversation during that process was that it was fucking problematic and troublesome. I hated every part of it because I couldn't get a straight like table or Excel comparing various programs, blah, blah, blah. It was super opaque. Uh, I just picked something that paid something if I die tomorrow. Uh, and I picked something that if I didn't die, at least I could pay for like the first 30 days of hospital healthcare. Uh, I had to Google very hard to figure out whether it was a good idea to do something called early stage catastrophic illnesses, which means that somehow you figure out that you have kidney cancer really early. And mm -hmm. I found out that screening was a terrible idea if I bought insurance for cancer because if I wanted to screen myself for cancer and I found out that cancer at early stage was preventable, then the insurance wouldn't pay me out. So technically it would make more sense for myself to not scream myself and end up with terminal stage cancer and then at least get an insurance payout at that point. Uh, so the interesting thing about all this is that apart from the dreadful experience, which is pretty standard with financial service companies, is that you got asked a bunch of questions, some information, it was or wasn't particularly relevant to you in your case, uh, and you got a product that you did or did not feel was kind of shaped for you. Um, and it kind of also demonstrates really the confusion in the industry in terms of what they should be selling you. So, Usually it's kind of, let's tweak the existing product with something that's fancy, rather than radically rethinking the whole product. Um, but what is interesting about insurance at the moment, and I don't know how familiar some of you are with the business of selling insurance, but apart from the bit that is, you know, going to someone and telling you what insurance, they will collect a bunch of data from you, which is a preset script. All of that gets compared to a bunch of actuarial tables, which are frankly speaking the law of average. So they'll take human beings of a certain age, of a certain gender, and you know, that was an average score, and yeah, compare you to the average score, whether you're high risk or low risk. Um, which is good news if you are a high risk category, because presumably you're probably getting better value insurance, but it's not exactly good news if you're, you know, well, athletic, not a couch potato, and taking care of yourself. You can sit there going, well, why am I paying for, you know, the risk that somebody else creates, for example. Um, so, so that's one experience. Um, anyone care to share their experience of seeing the doctor recently? No? There are a couple of doctors in the audience. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Even better. So, I mean, let me paraphrase uh, visits to the doctor these days. I mean, usually one only waits to see the doctor when something's happened. Yeah? Something hurts or you don't quite understand something happening in your, in your body and therefore you go and see the doctor. So, you waited for the trigger to start with, which is something's not right. So, you've gone to see the doctor and then what happens? sit in a waiting room for quite some time until it's your turn to see the doctor. And then you go and see the doctor. Roughly speaking, how long has the doctor got to consult with you? Five minutes. If you're lucky, yes. Yeah. Well, let's go for five, I like that. And what happens in those five minutes? Drugs. Well, that's at the end. What happens during the five minutes? Well, you get a few dumb questions asked, don't you? Because now the doctor's into hypothesis generation mode and trying to deduce what might be wrong with you based on what his or her experiences and what answers they're getting from you, kind of thing. So it's an instant in time, a bunch of questions that are pretty much, you know, influenced by the experiences that if that doctor themselves and their experience versus what you've reported as being your symptoms. And if you're lucky, you end up with the right outcome because it's a simple thing and they recognize it immediately. But if it's complex, then it starts getting quite tricky. And in Singapore, you then get referred to somebody else as a Singapore model. Uh, but in other countries, you tend to deal with your general practitioner for quite a bit longer. Uh, so that's not particularly satisfactory either, knowing that, uh, you know, it's not an exact science. Medicine's never been an exact science. And we should all content ourselves in knowing that a general practitioner is not an expert at every single topic. It's impossible. So they know a little bit about a few topics, and they do their best to carry out their function and make references where they can to actually get the answer where they don't know the answer for the studious ones. All that to say that what we're facing, and we go on looking at other stakeholders in, in, in the world, such as, for example, the government and how they deal with it, but really what to say, and to reflect the point by Lajan made, which is it's a highly fragmented area of, of our everyday lives in terms of the information that exists. But that information is absolutely critical to live in better healthcare. Um, and so 
um, it would be great if we could actually try and change that in terms of being able to try and connect those dots, being able to re refer to other pieces of information. So this is where, this is why there are people on, on records such as Koshler, for the guy who founded Sun Microsystems, uh, Eric Topol, uh, renowned uh, cardiologist, etc., who have written reams and reams of materials to this fundamental shift in the delivery of healthcare driven by digitization, by mobile devices, sensors, etc. And the reason they're talking about this is because what you're finding with digitization is that each individual stakeholder that we've spoken about, although we only talked about that one and that one at the moment, but obviously this one by inference, uh, are generating their own information in their own way, in a much easier way. So who's, got a, who's wearing um, a Fitbit or a jaw bone or uh, something? One, I saw two or three in the room. It's surprising how few it is still. Um, mind you, some of you probably bought it and gave up three months afterwards because you only got steps data. Uh, but that's fine, that's understandable. You know, we're all early adopters when we get into this and you know, we're helping the ecosystem learn how to do things better. Um, but we are nevertheless generating data about ourselves uh, which in the short term helps us, and we'll come back to that. But in the long term, you can imagine where some of these, some of the information will help your conversation with your doctor. And imagine uh, doctor's surgery in 10, 15 years time, what will happen is that your phone or a device that you're wearing has recorded a ton of information about where you've been, what sleep you've had, what you've been eating, um, you know, what sort of uh, stress levels you've been facing, etc. Uh, and so in the future, you'll come into the doctor's surgery, because something's slightly wrong with you, and there'll be an automatic uploading of that information to the computer, into the doctor's computer, and an automatic reference point to other people in the same sort of demographics showing the same symptoms, um, in order to be able to try and do an automated diagnostic. Um, so as you can see, you're starting to move to a, towards a, a way of delivering primary health care that's going to be much more efficient in the way it's done, and therefore, theoretically, helping your physician, who spent seven years training, actually deliver what they would like to do, which is consulting with you around your wellness, rather than trying to rush you through a five-minute process to find out how they correct your problem. So you can see where this is going in terms of you're starting to see an ecosystem that's starting to change, where doctors are starting to get rewarded, not now, in the future, but you'll get rewarded by making sure that you stay well, rather than by correcting what's wrong with you. Yeah? Um, and so, all of that data generated goes up into, I put it in information clouds, I'm trying to be as generic as possible. But what I'm trying to explain is that it all goes into a central or a way of aggregating data so that you end up with a, a much better way of referencing, much better way of identifying issues, a much better way of, of, um, of diagnosing, etc. So it's a very powerful uh, paradigm shift going on and one that's going to make a significant difference to the way in which we experience healthcare in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And that's just the digital bit. So if we haven't spoken about regenerative medicine, nanotechnology, and all the other things that will make fascinating topics for other meetings. So, um, just in case you thought that this digital health thing was just starting out and was kind of a, a new phenomenon, etc., um, this is just the US. This is a sheer number of startups about 18 months, two years ago, last time we did the audit, in the US. So as you can see, you've got every single stakeholder represented, insurance, patients, physicians, the big pharma case, and along the line, you've got every single um, element of the value chain of healthcare, from finding a doctor, to paying your bills, to actually trying to get some healthcare via phone. What you're seeing there is essentially what I would describe, and we'll come back to some of those, essentially what I would describe as the third industrial revolution. I don't know how much some of you have read about the, industri the second industrial revolution, which started in Europe, but it started as a cottage industry. You know, people started buying weaving machines, etc., in their own little backyards, and started creating more efficient products, and then slowly over the years, started aggregating to bigger, bigger corporates. Um, we will see the same in this. This will start consolidating, and is already starting to consolidate, and I'll touch about that towards the end in terms of giving you a flavor of who among the big guys are starting to take a position within digital health. Okay, so what we'll focus on here, and I'll, you'll have to guide me on how much time we put into things, because there's an awful lot of information here, and we'll probably spend the rest of the afternoon here, but I'm conscious of Sunday afternoon. Um, but what we will do is spend some time looking at digital, uh, big, big data itself. We've all heard of the term big data. 
I assume. So we'll talk about it in the context of healthcare. We'll talk about wearables and sensors, because I think there's um, a notion generally in most people's heads that it's something you wear around your wrist. Um, I would like to show you where we can go beyond that. Um, but it's all about business models. I think some of you are familiar with the term. Essentially what I'm talking about is how is the industry fundamentally changing as a result of this technology shift. And then I'll talk about funding because, of course, the greatest testament or demonstration of how an ecosystem is evolving is to follow the money. Um, and, of course, it's something very close to what I do on a day-to-day -day business. Um, but just showing you some of the trends, both in the US but also in Asia, will give you a flavor of where digital health is going. I was going to talk about regulations, but we'll probably run out of time. So um, we'll figure out how we get the information to share with you because it is actually quite an interesting impact. Um, who's heard of 23andMe? Who knows what happened to 23 me last year? Yeah, what did happen to 23 me last year? Well, basically they got some issues with the FDA. Mm -hmm. and they had to withdraw the health management mm -hmm. of the company. Yeah, okay. So that's why that topic is massively important. Digital health is in that gray zone. Um, and in some cases, like a jawbone wrist, uh, wearable, it doesn't require regulations because it's literally just counting steps. But when the device is starting to interpret that data and give you a guidance on your on your health, then it requires regulations. But it's a new area, so you can imagine every single regulatory environment is running around trying to figure out how to regulate it. The US have released their guidelines, the European Union is kind of thinking about it, and um, the rest of the world is watching what the other two are doing. Anyway, come back to that. So big data, guys. Um, I think this is a very powerful quote, since we started with quotes, I thought I'd carry on with quotes. Uh, Thomas Goetz, uh, who's well known, if you go to uh, TED Med or, or TED Talks, you'll find Thomas turns up quite regularly. Um, he's of the opinion that, uh, as you can see, the healthcare is not a science problem, it's really an information problem. Um, and his uh, greatest case study is uh, when you go for an annual checkup and the data comes back, and usually you get about seven or eight forms of A4 covered in data, none of us know what to do with that data. If you're lucky, the doctor will walk you through some of it. But it's an awful lot of Greek, really, if you pardon the expression. His, his opinion, it doesn't have to be. That data should be, it's your data. You know, it's about you. Therefore, that data should be represented in a way that you can understand it and take a decision. At the moment, if you ask your doctor for the data, which you're theoretically right to do so, you wouldn't know what to do with that data. Because most of it is complete gobbledygook to us. Um, and so he's, he's of the opinion that, that should change. Uh, and so if you go to TED and find his, his talk, you'll find it absolutely fascinating. But big data, just to refresh everyone, is really uh, about four key v, four Vs. Um, as you can imagine, there are a greater number of varieties of sources of data coming through. Um, we, with our wearables and our phones, are starting to create a new class of data. But uh, you can just imagine in a healthcare environment the sheer level and different types of data that exist, uh, ranging from a, an X-ray through to an electronic health record of a doctor's surgery, for example. All of that, of course, is very distinct. Nothing talks to each other, it's all very distinct. Uh, and so you then you get to um, the amount of data, it's growing incredibly fast. Um, bear in mind, that I think I looked at the date uh, last year, I think 90% of all data generated in the world was generated in the last two years. So that gives you a feeling of this, just a sheer amount and a sheer velocity of data being created uh, in, in the world. Uh, and therefore creating that opportunity, let's say, going forward. Um, now, the important thing, of course, is the quality of that data. Uh, and so a lot of the new business models that are coming through are helping us be able to deal with those four of these in, a, in an adequate way. Six areas I'll cover in terms of big data. Some of those might be familiar to you, some of them less so. Uh, the first one is genomics. Um, who's, presumably everybody's heard of genomics? Sequencing the genome. We'll talk about it in a little while. Um, data analytics, as you would imagine, with all this data, someone's going to make a lot of money analyzing it, um, in this particular, and therefore making sense of it. Uh, public awareness, um, now that we have access to this data, we have access to devices, it's a lot easier for us to be able to interpret that data ourselves and end up with a better understanding of, for example, um, the spread of a flu bug around the country. So, um, Supporting providers, um, so how do we use that data to help clinical trials, for example? I'll talk about that in a short while. Uh, Self-care, how do we help ourselves with all that data? 
And finally, of course, the ecosystem. How do we start bringing all this data together so we start making some sense of that data? So, I won't, I'll dive into those separately in a minute. So, genomics and beyond. So, this is this famous 23andMe. It's here. Uh, 23andMe, 99 bucks. You send your DNA in, they analyze it, and they send you back some of your DNA sequence. It's not the full sequence. And um, from that, you can start paying an understanding of your, the predisposition you have in relation to certain diseases. Um, I think at last count, I was looking at their data, 800,000 people have used 23andMe. Um, and um, they have encroached the DNA, uh, the, the FDA. They, get, they did get told to stop doing what they were doing. That's been changed. They now regain FDA approval for certain diseases. Um, and so they're back in business as far as the healthcare uh, environment is concerned. And so much so back in business that they signed a $60 million deal with Roche, a big drug firm, uh, a few months ago, uh, enabling Roche to look at that data on an anonymized basis to start looking at disease patterns and how they could potentially affect cancer, which is Roche's primary focus area. Um, and I'll come back as to why that's benefiting Roche in a minute. Um, but there's a few other ideas there in terms of uh, the key, you know, some of the, the better known names there. I won't dive into each one of them. Um, I'm sure that um, you can Google these and find out a bit more, but they're, they're fairly well-known players in that space. Data analytics, um, sorry. Uh, yeah. So they do they do it based on the SMPs of the, the single nucleotide. Right? So do you think are they going to be going to the full genome processing or or are there other companies that are going to look at the, the full genome or, or the So in terms of the an analytics or the actual yeah. the sequencing itself? Yeah, I mean I would assume they have to sequence it for Yeah. So the challenge is the sequencing. So the analytics is fairly or simple. The actual interpretation data will give you some, some interpretation for you to use um, is, um, is, is something that's a little bit easy to do. It's really just software. So a lot of uh, SaaS models or uh, software as a service are coming up for you to use either as a doctor or as a private individual. Um, the uh, full sequencing is possible. Uh, Illumina, I'll come back to me, Illumina is a better known of those players uh, in that space. They were the CEO of Illumina was at um, Entech. Singapore earlier this year, uh, talking about what they were doing. Um, I think Balaji touched on it. The challenge is cost. Um, so when Clinton launched um, precision medicine in terms of DNA sequencing, not what Obama just did. I'm talking about what Clinton was doing back in 2006, I think it was. Um, I may have the date wrong. Um, I think it was something like three and a half million dollars to sequence one DNA, which means, of course, you know, apart from academic research, no one could afford it. Um, Moore's law has more or less determined that, and I think you shared that graph, more or less determined that to sequence a genome can be as little now as about a thousand bucks. Now, let's be realistic. A thousand bucks as long as you bought the three million dollar machine that does the sequencing behind. So it's really a volume game, so only a laboratory could afford it. So until we get more laboratories, only more of those machines, it's going to be a while before you get full sequencing. So to answer your question, I think 23andMe is an adequate halfway house to, to sequence your genome and get a better understanding of it. Um, if you want to go to the step, le the next level up, it's going to cost you a great deal more money. Um, physicians already getting into this will charge you about a couple of thousand dollars for the sequencing, but it's another four to five thousand dollars to help you interpret and take the right decisions. Kind of logical, really. Then they become your consultant in relation to your DNA sequence. Right. Are you familiar with this uh, technique of human longevity incorporated? With the CEO of G, uh, Gene Creek Venter. He's doing yeah. DNA and then it's going to be all sorts of sequences. Sure. Complete. There are many out there. Uh, some of them are very focused on certain disease areas, some of them are broad uh, in what they do. Um, I, I don't claim to know them all yet. I, I do try and keep up to date with what's new. Um, so, the data analytics, um, let's, we'll pick up practice fusion because it's one of the better known ones. It's the one that has raised quite a significant amount of funding over the last few years. Uh, practice Fusion basically has created a free health record software for doctors, doctors and clinics to use. They were initially only in the US, they've now launched in the UK. Um, but what they've, their, their principle is following, if we give you the software free and you start putting your data into it rather than on bits of paper, then you'll be able to get more information out of it. But at the same time, uh, if, you, if you get more and more surgeries doing it, or more and more physician practices doing it, and you start aggregating that data, then you can start getting a lot more insights. So what you're starting to see is things that are broadly called 
it's called a social medicine. In other words, physicians being able to talk to each other around, I've seen this symptom, here's a photograph, uh, you know, had, had, can you help me with where you've seen this before? And so creating a great deal more power at a physician level around understanding data, interpreting data, and, and therefore supporting diagnostic directly. It doesn't do diagnosis, it just provides data insights to doctors beyond just the sample of patients they see on a day-to-day -day basis, which is of course a very small sample versus the whole population. Um, but it's very successful, it's starting to uh, get a, used by a great deal of phys physicians in the US who are getting benefit from that. Um, and there's, I won't bore you with detail, but there's some fantastic bits of analysis out there around the reduction in health costs from using health, uh, health records, for example, eliminating errors. Uh, being aware of what drugs a patient is actually allergic to and not prescribing that for example. Um, so you can start, we'll, get back, we'll look at cost savings in a minute, but um, it, it's it the, just the electrific, electronification, whatever the right term is, of health records would save billions of dollars in the US alone, so the world over would be significant. Um, so I'll, that's practice fusion, but I'll always look at the other. Cena Health is the other one, it's quite well known as well. Um, so public awareness, in other words, how do you create greater awareness in the uh, population as a whole? So if you remember my piece of information about India, where 10% of people have got diabetes, but less than 1% turn up for consultation, they don't turn up, the fact that they're not turning up is not because they're not interested or because they've decided they're just gonna die and, or get diabetes. It is entirely because they're not aware that diabetes even exists. If you're a rural farmer in India, you've probably got a GSM phone in your pocket rather than a smartphone, highly likely you've never heard of diabetes. So, you know, a symptom manifests itself, like a high, heightened heart rate, and all your eyesight starting to vary a little bit. They're not necessarily going to attribute that to diabetes. Um, so there are it's some interesting free ones. There's a health map and sick weather you can download and play with. Um, sick weather works on the basis of uh, Twitter information about disease and builds patterns based on that. Uh, health map, I forget what their input is, but you can download them and play with those. Sproxil is an interesting one. Um, did you know that in Cambodia, over 50% of anti-malarial drugs are fakes? Over 50%. So you can imagine how people are being poisoned, thinking that they're taking an anti-malarial drug. What's criminal, really, about that is that everyone's got a phone, pretty much, in Cambodia. So it must be simple to try and help someone who's just been given a drug packet that looks like the real thing to actually validate whether they've got the right pack in their hand. Sproxil is one of those companies that's doing that now. So the, the drug pack that is manufactured by the drug firm is issued with a unique number. And therefore, when you get the pack, as Joe Average and just been to the pharmacist, you can then send that number to a central phone number by SMS. Literally within five, 10 seconds, you get a response back as to whether it's a real pack or whether it's um, to be handed back to the pharmacist and get another one. Um, so really cheap way of eliminating, you know, counterfeit drug, or certainly eliminating the risk of someone poisoning themselves as a counterfeit drug. Um, support provider, so clinical and non-clinical intelligence. So all of that data that I talked about in relation to, to the big data, of course, it's, it's massively powerful in relation to helping the medical profession provide a better diagnosis uh, and managing your health, or helping you manage your health much better in the future. Uh, there's a couple that I'll touch on. IBM Watson, is that something that's familiar? The games. Well, it's only it's famous because I think Watson beat the Jeopardy champions, I think. Um, that's his moment of fame. Um, the thing to know about IBM Watson, it'll consume 200 volumes of um, uh, medical research every three seconds um, in terms of just digitizing it, uh, which means that um, it can very quickly get through uh, all of the medical research out there and start helping better cross reference and uh, you know, um, uh, matching of the data you're seeing at an individual patient level with what's happening in the bigger, wider world. Um, so you can imagine once you've got all of that in there and you start adding all the clinical trial data from big pharma companies and you start adding all the health records from patients, etc. Um, the sheer power of IBM Watson in relation to helping with diagnosis, particularly for rare diseases, for example. So what we're starting to see is some of the larger hospitals in the US um, trying how they're supporting diagnosis uh, with IBM Watson. Mayo Clinic, I think, is one of the, one of the ones, uh, big teaching hospital. Um, 
Flatiron um, is, um, is a case of uh, leveraging data um, from patients um, and genomic data in relation to the treatment of oncology. Their strap line, which is really cute, is software as a drug. Uh, it kind of says it already, which is how do you use software to actually solve the problem rather than administrating a chemical. Um, who here is familiar with uh, Angelina Jolie? Everyone, without <laughs> right. <laughs> Take it to the next stage then. Who knows what um, she is, famous is the wrong term, but well known for from his relation to her health? One, two, three, four. Okay, we'll pick on somebody else then. Lady behind the laggy. So what, what do you know about that? Uh, double mistake. Yeah. Yeah, she basically got, I think it was just a, a breast issue because she was at risk She did that very recently, but yeah, yeah. certainly a couple of years ago she had a double mastectomy. That's right. Do you know what triggered her decision beyond family history? Genome. Correct. Right. She did a full genome sequence, and there's a little protein called BRAC2, which is the determinant as to whether you are predisposed or not. Doesn't mean you've got it, it just means you're predisposed, yeah? And she did that test. It came up as you're predisposed. She then mixed that in, of course, with the family history. I think she lost her aunt and her mother, I think, to breast cancer. So the probability went through the roof as far as she was concerned, and she was going to take no risks. So that's why she had the operation. Uh, but it's a clear, it's one of the most high profile um, uses of, say, uh, gene sequencing with respect to health. Now, it's draconian, but it gives you a flavor of what the insights are starting to get on health uh, as an individual is concerned. And so Flatiron is trying to use that purely on oncology in terms of how to use all that data to try and really help uh, not only the industry that manufactures solutions, but also the patients in terms of how they manage it. But you can imagine how insurance are getting in there to come back to the, um, the case around being screened for insurance purposes earlier on. Uh, it's really, really powerful. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk, touch on that a little, little bit later on. Um, one of the things that's growing out of all of this is clinical trials. Um, biology showed some numbers which are a little out of date, so 2005. So I think you could say, safely say that generating a new drug that we get from the pharmacy is probably close to about two to two and a half billion dollars now. One new drug. Now, in that number are two big variables. One is the total cost to get to that drug. So you can imagine a number of drugs they've killed along the way that were deemed unsafe or literally weren't going to give any results. So that's all of it together. So it's kind of loaded towards one product. But that's how you pay for your business to run. Um, the other course is a clinical trial. There are three clinical trials in the development of a drug. Phase one is literally comes out of the lab, which is trying to figure out whether this thing works. Phase two will have to put it in a very small number of samples to continue testing that it works. And then if we get through all those stages, you go to phase three, which is let's get a sample of patients and we'll administer the drug on a blind basis. In other words, some people get it, some people don't get it, and then those that get it aren't being told, etc. So basically, it's completely random. Um, the FDA requires that that's usually between 5,000 and 10,000 people. So as they get a large enough sample to be able to understand what are the adverse events of that drug, and therefore to determine that it's sufficiently safe to be able to administer. So it goes beyond just testing the efficacy of the product when it's administered to the patient. Now, 10,000 patients over a period of time is a hell of a lot of money to run. So that's a huge drive in the cost of the drug. Now, um, that trial comes to an end more or less when it's determined by the protocol of that particular trial, uh, and which usually works with when it's time to hand the document to the FDA to get approval. Beyond that point, there's no further trial data. However, once the drug is approved and it's administered to everybody, because you know every I don't know, cancer patient suddenly gets administered, there's an awful lot more data there that's not being collected. So where devices come into play is to be able to start collecting that data. So um, there was a recent Apple event about a month ago, where they announced two things. One was the Apple Watch, so I'll take that off the table before everyone says Apple Watch. What was the other thing they announced? Spot on, research kit. Did anyone look that up and figure out what that was? So research kit is essentially an open source bit of software that allows patients, essentially, with their own phone or device to collect data about
about themselves and, of course, how they're going through the disease. So suddenly, you're going from a sample of five to 10,000 people for one drug trial to the drug is in the market, or not, is still in trial. The sample is millions. And it's a fraction of the cost. So you no longer need to get that patient to come in once a month to do their blood test, and then they go see the nurse, etc. So you can see where the cost is coming. A lot of that still needs to happen, but that needs to happen by exception rather than by everybody goes through it, just in case we have to catch something out, for example. And so all of that data means that you can start managing a disease in a much more effective way, which is why I think it's quite a cute slag. It's a slogan, which is the software of the drug. So that's essentially big data uh, from that perspective. Support self-care. Um, so that is really how you and I as individuals with a disease can manage our own disease using our device. Um, I've deliberately put Healing there because it's a Singapore startup, which is doing very well uh, in that very space. But I'll talk about Gluco today. Uh, and why I'll talk about Gluco? Because it's Medtronic. Who's heard of Medtronic? Probably top two or top three medtech firm in the world, is that roughly speaking right, I think? It's basically recently bought um, Coventus. Um, um, Medtronic just put $15 million of funding into Gluco last month. Um, what does Gluco do? Gluco enables any diabetic who's using a device to test their glucose levels to interact with their phone. And so the phone will start collecting, of course, lifestyle data. You'll put in your own dietary data in there. It'll read your glucose levels because it does it by interacting with that device that you're using. And it will then start you know, uh, defining certain calculations that you would normally do as diabetic patients, such as, for example, how much insulin I should be administering to myself. It also automatically sends that data up to your physician. So your physician can keep an eye on some of the data and be able to alert you whether there are certain things that are outside the norms, for example. So the, the glucose applications are naming diabetic patients who are on insulin, but all diabetic patients, essentially, to be able to manage their disease in a much more efficient way. These days, without that, they're pricking their finger, getting blood, putting it on a piece of paper, figuring out what the level is, and then working out according to a table what glucose they should, sorry, what insulin should be. It's very painful to manage diabetes. Very painful. Um, some of the others that you can you can look up as we speak. There is a need, of course, for all of that data to land on the same platform, um, because otherwise it remains that fragmented data that. Um, that I was talking about earlier on uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I'll, pick on a, I'll pick on a couple. This, this is the, that's the kind of the first out of the box. Uh, Qualcomm Life, or Qualcomm is a very large tech company. Uh, they have a fund called Qualcomm Life. But they established a platform called 2Net, which is open source and allows a lot of the devices to start feeding that information into one cloud, essentially, so that you can then reuse that data. But um, the new kit on the block is HealthKit which all of you have got. If you own, uh, I guess, uh, iPhone 5S and beyond, is that right? Certainly, iOS, iOS, iOS 8 brought that out. Um, I had a recent meeting with, uh, while well, I was on the subject of insurance, the CEO of one of the insurance companies I mentioned, um, and he was, we were talking about health kit, and he was talking about this data collection, etc. And I said to him, oh, I see you've got an iPhone 5S on his desk. I said, do you know that that's collecting your data? He looked at me blankly. <laughs> so I said, well, pass me your phone. So I he handed the phone over and I tapped the health kit button. <laughs> this thing sprung up. Did a couple of things to show the dashboard that shows steps and walking distance. I mean, this graph for the last six months was there. <laughs> Woo! He looked scared. But I said, listen, that's, that's what's happening. You have to switch that off if you want to switch that off. But the phone is actually tracking that data for you. Um, and so, uh, and that's health kit doing that. It's taking various inputs, but the accelerometer, the chip on the phone, is already collecting that information. Healthkit is a beautiful way of bringing all information together. Now, most of us have used Healthkit, they're probably limited it to our weight, potentially a heart rate, depending on what machine you've used, um, and no doubt your steps and distance walk, etc. Most of the other information that you, know, you could collect is not on there yet. Uh, it sits with your doctor at the moment, but at some stage it will become available for you to use going forward. Um, it's interesting to see, therefore, to come back to the point that I made earlier on around new entrance into healthcare. You know, Apple a long time ago decided they'd done music, they'd done video, and all that type of media. They were moving into new areas. The car, the home, and health. They're doing health in a big way. Okay. 
savings, just to give you a flavor. So you saw an awful lot of applications there I mentioned, and uh, I tried to describe what some of them are doing. But all I have to say, this is McKinsey data. Um, there's a report out there about digital health and value. Uh, you'll find this graph in it. Um, but it, it's, it, they're approximates, and, and McKinsey does say very clearly that, that they're estimates based on not really knowing what all of the extent of innovation will be in the future, so they're basing it on what they know. So I, essentially saying that this number could be a lot bigger. Um, but it's interesting to look at the US because the US is the biggest spender in the world on, on healthcare. Um, 18%, 1-8% of GDP in the US is spent on healthcare versus an average of about 11% in the European Union. Um, so it gives you a flavor of just how much they're spending. And they're spending that kind of money because of it's, it's, there's no uniform, single one player in it. It's a lot of stakeholders. And largely because the US system works on a number of procedures done rather than an outcome. Um, but hopefully some of you decide to see how that greater level of data means you can start moving towards an outcome rather than literally just doing procedures. Um, but, um, so I talked about how you could accelerate R&D, clinical trials briefly, to give you a flavor. Um, I talked about how you could manage disease a little bit. We'll go back to that. Um, of course, you're starting to see reduced rates. I was talking about that earlier on in terms of you know having a better understanding of someone's health records when they turn up at a hospital in an emergency, which you might stop some of the errors uh, that are going on. Uh, and of course, there's certain things around payments. And, you know, the, the insurance companies are starting to look at working out how they can change payments for um, you know rewarding certain actions, for example, around uh, wellness and diet. The idea being you're reducing costs further down the road because to your point, your question earlier on, just an insurance company has a vested interest in trying to help you drive that simply because you're going to reduce the claims. It might have an impact on policy, <laughs> but it's not just something else. Uh, so this is a very interesting graph. It's simple, but it gives you a very strong flavor of, typically speaking, what are the drivers? Uh, all of them sit on what I would describe as that data-driven healthcare uh, element that I was talking about, up till now. Um, and you know, resulting in a substantial amount of money saved. So you can see why Obama went on record about what, three weeks ago, roughly speaking, saying that precision medicine was you know a key focus area for for the U.S. going forward. And they are a leader in that, without doubt. Um, but it was good to see Obama stand up there and give it a seal of approval in terms of we're going to put some money, we're going to drive this through. So wearables talked about that a little bit. So any questions on big data uh, and the impact that's having on healthcare? How is the quality of the data uh, you know, sure if you have one billion people having their phones yeah. and everyone enters it differently, if I feel well, she doesn't feel well in the same way, how is that? In it, it, it's, it's an excellent question and one that is occupying the minds of a lot of people uh, who are looking at data or data-driven healthcare as a, as a way forward. Um, and you know the, the precision of uh, sensors is getting better. For example, um, there are ways of deduping data these days. There are ways of, um, of comparison of data to start eliminating outliers and, and um, uh, anomalies. Let's say in terms of data patterns, etc. It's definitely not. We're a long way from perfect, um, but they're getting much smarter trying to um, improve the data integrity that's coming through and the data sources and validating the data sources before they allow into the ecosystem that's collecting data at the top. But it is, it is a concern at the moment and that, you know, um, part of my French, but shit in equals shit out. So you've got to be careful what you put in the system if you want some decent results. Mm -hmm. uh, the market say incentives and disincentives, uh, what do you think coming I mean, will we start to see that, uh, let's say, from insurance companies or some of these, uh, it's a general question, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question to me because um, all of this works as long as there's behavior change. Um, we, as individuals, need to take greater ownership of our health, um, and therefore, uh, what's pushing the early doctors will do anything the first time and they'll like it or not like it, but it's the rest of that bell curve of people that you need to bring on board to actually come through. I guess some of it will be driven by proof of the pudding. People will start, you know, seeing it, um, the value of it. Sorry, um, millennials, which discounts quite a few of us in the room, but millennials do that every day anyway. They expect to get the answer out of their telephone. Um, but you're right. I think payers, governments, or insurance companies, etc., will start um, looking at ways of trying to drive behaviour 
um, towards an outcome that's much more preventative, much more look at your data, empower yourself as to the decisions you're taking for your health. Um, employers are doing that too, for example. The employers recognize that, you know, I think I saw some data the other day that if someone's BMI, which is the um, weight to body height ratio calculator to tell you whether you're verging on obese, uh, I think for a male, certainly, if it goes above 28, 29, you're at a 40% higher risk of being an absentee stroke, you know, um, taking sick leave, etc. Uh, how good that correlation is, I'm not sure, but the data showed certainly there was a, a likely correlation between the two. Um, in the U.S., that's a heavy driver. I mean, uh, an employer in the U.S. will spend an average of $7,000 per head on insurance costs. It's a big difference to the U.K. or, or Singapore. So you can see why employers in the US are, are big into this and trying to understand how they can reduce their claims, improve the performance of employees, etc., whilst at the same time making it fun. So the trade off. Singapore government's doing a lot on that. Uh, you know, they have an app, you earn points every time you do steps, etc. Sing Health is paying a ton of money on that um, with some degree of success. But it, again, moving the population towards that will take time. Given the impact on open source technology in the commercial IT world, does that kind of have an impact on healthcare and big data? In terms of what, the proliferation of new applications? Is well, that? so you showed so many companies doing so many different things, and I just couldn't help but think, like, am I going to lock all my data up in a proprietary system like that? Like, what if they go fast, you know? Who owns that data? Yeah, so you own the data, and that's the way it should go. Um, no, I think what you'll see that's my, my own hypothesis there, but you'll see something more like an e-wallet of your health data. So you will be giving access to that data by a third party who's providing you with uh, the health uh, analysis or support or that kind of stuff going on. So you, you'll ultimately be the owner of that data. So we're not going to see any equivalent to, I don't know, Linux, you know, in something as successful uh, as Linux in the world of healthcare software. Well, Linux is an operating system, so I know. Know. So as an example, it's, it's a bit, I mean, there's data which you own, and then there's software that will enable the yes. service. So in terms of the software, will we see a lot of open source health stuff? You are. I mean, for example, Research Kit by Apple is open source. Right. So there will be people out there, companies <coughs> out there, generating open source software to enable the rest of the profession, or the rest of the industry, to start building from that. Yeah, right. and that's one of the drivers, I suspect, in getting better. Um, outcomes from that data, but outcomes from that software. Yeah. Related to that is also um, so BMI bio movement, which is kind of developing, but it's still quite expensive. Like uh, open PCR machine, right now it's still five hundred dollars, uh, and then getting to use that, you can you can amplify your DNA by uh, analyzing that, yeah. reading that. You, you you're going to need a lot of knowledge. Yeah, yeah so and then there's still some ways to go. Correct. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's just very much a nascent space, and we're seeing the beginning of, of the revolution. Um, so, wearable sensor devices. I like this quote. Um, if we not did it deliberately, I'm pissed off just about every single doctor in the world until they read the actual article he'd written, where he wasn't saying that 80% of doctors would lose their jobs, he was just saying that 80% of what a doctor does now will change. Um, and so, um, you know, if you talk to doctors who look at this seriously, they, they know that the way in which they engage with their patients will change substantially going forward. Um, and it's good news for doctors, you know, you spend seven years training, you want to do what doctors want to do, rather than just gather data and churn it through a computer. Um, and, but a lot of the way in which they're going to look at you and engage with you will be driven by the information that you're bringing to the table. Um, you know, I'll come back to the case study, but at the moment, cardiovascular patients, high potential patients. Um, usually what happens is that you're at absolutely no risk for most of your life until you are at risk. In other words, you've been diagnosed as hypertension. It's kind of neither in between really. It's zero or one, it's very binary. Um, now, some of you in the room, and actually no one put their hand up with it, but some of some people around Singapore I've seen have got heart rate monitors on their wrists. So it's typically it's one called the Surge, which has a heart rate monitor on there. The Apple Watch has got one, etc. Now, those particular devices are now able to actually measure your heart rate on an interval basis. And therefore, theoretically, so I haven't seen any software application that does that yet, but it should be coming, you can start measuring your, your at-rest heart rate, in other words, when you're sleeping, over a period of time. Which means that as your hypertension problem rises, so will your heart rate rise. 
And so now you're going to start seeing a trend that says, I'm increasing at risk, I need to do something about it. Like change my diet, go for exercise, health, et cetera. And therefore, hopefully, take action early enough to reduce your risk of getting hypertension, or certainly delaying the onset of hypertension, which delays, you know, improves your life quality, but also delays all the costs that might come on to actually uh, treat your hypertension going forward. Of course, drug firms don't like the idea of this, but you should certainly applaud that and, and take ownership of that as soon as you can, uh, particularly as you get older. Uh, so, wearables. Um, there's a common, uh, I put that slide up simply because I think there's a common um, uh, understanding, I think, that uh, a wearable is something you stick on your wrist. Um, and largely because, of course, everything we've seen so far has been Fitbits, jaw bones, misfits, um, my Garmin, for example, etc. So, there's a lot of those things around, and they're all usually worn on your, on your wrist. And so, I would just put them in the category of the activity tracker on the left. Um, but the reason I bring this slide up is because, in fact, the whole world of biosensing wearables, uh, and I do the emphasis on biosensing because it is literally trying to convert a biological element, be it external or internal, into a data output that you can start using for something else. Um, and we're starting to see a plethora of other types coming through. So the smartwatch, obviously, is one that you guys are familiar with. I think Apple's made enough noise with it, the launch of its watch. Um, I think, was it Friday? Pre-orders was it last Friday, I think, pre-orders. Um, and so we'll see what comes out of that. The beauty of that, of course, that all of the applications that we know exist on our phone will start you know, appearing on the watch and being much more powerful in terms of being able to take you know, regular heart rate data for, from you, etc. Um, but then is the, the other three categories which are often not mentioned or forgotten about. Um, smart clothing. Anyone heard of Athos? Not for sale in Singapore yet, it's just launched in the US. Um, Athos has been in usage actually for quite some time now with professional sports teams. Most professional sports teams, um, if you look at them, uh, if you look at them in, in, when they're playing now, their shirts, so I was watching the Rugby Six Nations uh, this year, uh, most of their shirts have got some sort of little bulb at the back of the um, pod, at the back of the, the neck, or the neck, sorry, on the, the, below the collar, the, behind the, uh, the player's uh, head. That's collating a mass of data on that player. And so, um, essentially, what's happening now in sport is that you've got uh, telematics that normally you find in your car, which tells you what you're doing with your car, is now telling the doctor, team doctor, and the team tactician what is happening in their team in terms of speed, in terms of movement. Uh, you know, is that guy starting to trail a leg? In other words, is injured? Do we take him off, etc.? So the whole management of teams is radically changing at the moment because of things like Athos, which is actually measuring muscle, um, a usage, as well as heart rate and various other pieces of information. Um, so it's, it's sports changing, but our force is now starting to make it available for you and I, Joe Average, to buy. It ain't cheap, but sorry, yes. yes they're also wearing uh, impact sensors. Yeah, so they're doing a trial in the US with American football uh, helmets, you're absolutely right. Uh, and rugby as well. And rugby too now? Sticky to one, yeah. Okay, right. Which is good, it's good to see, certainly. Um, but there was a recent uh, interesting article about a couple of months ago. Was that? I think a fairly promising American football player decided to uh, quit his career, didn't he? He was very worried about uh, concussion issues he had. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see how that's changing people's behavior in terms of their, their own future. Um, patches and tattoos, we'll come back to one of those. Um, it's a company called MC10, uh, which is developing a little tattoo that will get literally painted onto your skin. And we'll start doing things like such as measuring heart rate, um, uh, perspiration, salt content, uh, your environment data, etc. Um, and will um, have a much longer lasting battery life than your average iPhone. Um, and so that will just be stuck on and will go. Um, I'll talk about another one in a minute called Zio. And ingestibles and smart implants, um, it says what it says really, well, beside to see devices, you're, you're swallowing devices that are talking to your phone. Um, so Proteus is a case in point. That's been developed to uh, take alongside your medicine. And so if you're a patient taking a lot of medicine uh, because you've got a chronic disease such as diabetes or cardiovascular or, or oncology or sorry, cancer, um, that particular device will help you understand um, you know, the effectiveness of the product, uh, how often you've taken it, whether you've taken it, when you're supposed to have taken it, and of course a wealth of data, kind of back to what I was saying earlier on, to help the industry improve treatment in terms of sharing data as, as opposed to your disease and the drug you're taking. Um, so that's really wearables as we are known now. Um, there will probably be new inventions as we go along, but largely speaking, that is, that is what is biosensing wearables when people talk about biosensing wearables. 
Uh, why is it important? I think some of you, if you've used them, um, will identify with what I've got on my slide. But it's important because it's creating data well, well real time. Um, it's not when you go see the doctor and you give them information. It's not when you're doing your annual checkout once a year. It's real time and it's pretty much every day, every minute, every second of your life that is generating that data. Um, it's measuring physiological par parameters very easily. Uh, so in other words, you, your behavior every day, etc. Uh, but of course, it's able to start relating to what's going on around you in your environment. Because you know, it's easy to collect weather data and uh, you know, where you've been in terms of location, plane versus uh, know, benzene factory, to take an extreme case. Um, but all these things, of course, are starting to build a much more 2D or 3D picture about you as a person and why you may be ill. Uh, and of course, finally, it, it's allowing you to start analyzing some of these trends for yourself. Uh, certainly, I get a lot of this watch when I'm doing uh, tri uh, training for triathlon because um, it gives me a lot more data about how efficient I am with my running and my swimming, etc. Um, I think most of you are aware of the, the whole ecosystem of, of the wearable. You know, you're collecting the data. It goes into a cloud, um, and then you get feedback um, either on versus your own goals or versus a bunch of people you're competing with, um, which, which is got this piece here. Uh, I've got the health kit label here to give you a flavor of what I mean by the uh, feedback results in terms of you're getting the information visibly to look at. So you can look at trends, for example. You know, am I doing 10,000 steps a day, or is it once a week and I do 10,000 steps? And if so, what do I do about changing that? Uh, and of course, the community, the peer pressure is is incredibly powerful behavioral change tool. You get you start competing with people you know. Uh, it becomes incredibly um, competitive. Uh, who's actually hitting their targets um, on a um, on a week by week basis? Uh, my 71 year old mother went trekking in Nepal last month, last month. Um, wanted to know her distance. She would be walking every day, so I bought her a Fitbit. The outcome of that is now she's competing with everyone else in the family in relation to the number of steps. Um, so it's, it's amusing, but, uh, but it's, it, you can see what it, what it creates by way of uh, behavior. So in, in terms of behavior change, uh, maybe we'll get to this later, but uh, uh, what, what are we starting to see? I mean, is, is that starting to, are these tools they do all health with this type of thing? Yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting question because I've was, I was, I had that question before. I was trying to find one data point that actually kind of demonstrated that. Uh, and, and I found one about a month ago because the CEO of Weight Watchers was on a record recently announcing his results, which weren't very good. And um, he has attributed it to this particular metric. The fact that people are now able to measure their um, own exercise behavior, lifestyle, let's call it that, means that a lot of people who generally rely on Weight Watchers and Weight Watcher clubs to drive their lifestyle around weight are now starting to rely more on this and taking more empowerment from the data they're getting. And so, whether right or not, Weight Watchers CEO has more as attributed is it the impact on his revenue on the fact that wearables are starting to change people's behavior as to how they manage their, their weight. It's quite an interesting data point, anyway. You would think they might have thought about, as Weight Watchers, getting into this kind of business. You thought, yeah. But he's a classic case of Kodak. Uh, the, yeah. year before, the year before, he laughed at it, saying it was a fad. But so did all the Swiss watchmakers, who are now, of course, doing U-turns now that the Apple Watch has been launched. Uh, so it's interesting to see, you're right, yeah. But it's a classic case of industry, you know, repeating the same mistakes over and over again in terms of their future. Um, okay, so biosensors. Um, two categories, really, in my head. There's this one here that you guys are all familiar with. You know, the Misfit, Jawbone, Whittings, Basis. I think Biology's got a basis, I think, on his wrist. Um, that's the bit everybody knows. Um, this boy here will probably wreck the revenue models of all of these guys. Without a shadow of a doubt. Shadow of a doubt. So what you'll see is what um, Nike announced last year. Yes, sorry. Why do you say that? Uh, because a lot of the business models for these guys, Mr. Jorbert, etc., is the hardware that they sold to put on your wrist. Yeah. And a lot of them have been quite cute in the way in which they. Uh, aesthetically built these things to fit on your wrist. So Jawbone was the first one, had a few problems, but now works quite well, and it's quite sort of pretty-ish, I think. Yeah, you got one of them. Uh, Misfit then designed one that was with a battery. The battery ran out every six months rather than every week, uh, and it was waterproof, you could put it on your wrist, and it looked like a jewel, etc. So that's how they were selling it. They were collecting data, and it was kind of more sold because of what you were looking at in the store on the shelf. Now, Apple's device coming out, which will be copied by zillions of others, and they're going forwards, 
more or less negates that because now in one watch you've got time, you've got phone, you've got apps, you've got uh, an accelerometer, an HR monitor, etc. So what you'll see is what Nike's done. It was Nike, wasn't it, last year? I think Nike said, right, we're not doing the fuel band anymore. Can that, we're just doing software. So I think Nike was smart enough to recognize the fact that the hardware side will just be, the consumer side will just be taken out uh, by the large players like Apple. So what Apple's done is legitimize the space because I think the Apple Watch sold out in the US and China within the hour of launching on Friday. The $17,000 Apple Watch sold out in one hour. I don't know how many there were, but they sold out in one hour. <laughs> Incredible. Um, so that's why, that's why I think that a lot of these guys will start changing their business models trying to address it. Then there's this space, which is often unheard of or certainly unexplored unless you really start looking at it. But it's the way in which wearables or biosensors are starting to change the way in which medicine is being delivered by nurses, by doctors, by surgeons, etc., on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll look at a couple of those, but uh, I put up there some of the more common names um, for, you, for you to sort of spend some time looking at in your own time. But I mentioned the tattoo earlier on, and I mentioned the pill you swallow earlier on. Um, we'll look at a couple more in a minute. So in relation to the wellness side, as I call it, uh, well, here's the famous Apple Watch launched on Friday. Um, the Garmin is the one I wear, which uh, does give a great deal of information around the efficiency of your running, for example, uh, the oscillation of your body as you're running, etc. So it's getting really quite clever in terms of what it tells you. And some of the key metrics that top athletes have had for, for years now and used to actually improve their own performance is now enabling Joe Average like myself to actually try and do something about being better at what they do. Um, this is the Athos. Uh, so I mentioned earlier on, as you can see, it's. Uh, either the, the bottoms and tops, but these little gray dots here are the little sensors that are measuring your muscle performance as you're exercising. Um, so it, it'll start helping you with recovery rates, for example. Uh, it'll start helping you around how one muscle's working better than another in relation to some of the weight training you're doing. Uh, and of course, as I described, professional teams who start managing that data much better. Um, and then LUMO, which is a completely radical change from that, uh, helps people with posture issues. Scoliosis has been the extreme version of that, but there are people long before that who visit their um, osteopath or their chiro uh, chiropractor on a regular basis, largely because they're sitting at their desk, stressed out on a keyboard, hunched over a keyboard, um, which is extremely bad for you. Um, the human body was not designed to do, uh, but this thing will help you. It will gen gently vibrate to remind you that you're sitting in a really bad posture to do something about it. Uh, so this is just a very minute sample of all the ones you've seen, but it does take you away from the stuff you wear over your wrist and show you some of the other things that are arrived in the consumer space um, that, are, that are going to make quite a difference to the way in which you do sport. Or, you know, for those of you who are early adopters, certainly, the rest of you, then at some stage in the next few years, you'll, you'll find it. It's the only thing you can buy in a store, probably. Um, Look at the medical side, diagnostic, chronic, and uh, monitoring. Um, so um, a live call, one here. Is a single channel ECG, so uh, I can measure my heart rate just by holding my phone between my fingers. Um, and it's 125 bucks to buy. All I need is an iPhone. Uh, I can send the, the whole, I get the full trace on my phone and I can send it to my doctor. This was one email. Um, and um, uh, it is so cheap that the Apollo Hospital Group in India has signed a deal with these guys to launch that particular device in their hospitals, more at the surgery primary care level, to enable doctors to do ECG tracking of their patients, rather than buying the general electrics machine or the Philips machine that's thousands of dollars. Um, now, you could probably say a general electric machine is far more accurate in terms of what it does, it's probably 26 channel ECG, etc. But as a starting point, an indicating starting point, while you're talking to the patient, you just give them the phone and let them hold them between their fingers, literally your index finger on each of these silver pads, and it'll give you that information, your ECG trace within 30 seconds. Sitting on the back of an iPhone 5, you can pass it around. Um, <clears throat> then you've got uh, Zio. Um, Zio basically is what I was describing by way of hypertension uh, treatment. Um, so you basically wear it as a blaster, you stick it on your chest. Um, battery lasts, I think, about uh, 14 days, 21 days, something. And it will trace your um, uh, your heart behavior over a long period of time, but on a regular basis as well. And so, if you are at risk, it's usually for patients who are at risk, then your uh, physician can prescribe this to you. So, on a small 
uh, trial basis in the US at the moment, uh, for you to actually go on, in, on your everyday life, everyday way of life, sorry, and, and wear the patch on your chest and uh, collect data that you can then provide to your physician or your professional cardiologist uh, who can start making some informed decisions about you rather than just the measurements that they currently do when you come into the surgery. So it's very, very powerful. This. Um, all of these are, uh, apart, apart from Q, all of these are FDA approved. So you start seeing them appearing in surgeries in the US and there's no reason why they shouldn't appear in, um, in, in Asia in certain countries where they're looking for ways of uh, uh, you know, delivering better health care at a lower price point. Um, you know, this will start replacing the stethoscope, which was invented in 1916. Are this to analyze for It's largely uh, everyday type uh, performance uh, in terms of diet uh, deficiencies, um, you know, are you taking the right level of zinc uh, in inputs, etc. So at the moment, oops, sorry, at the moment it is limited to um, what you and I would want to know out of it. But that's deliberately designed that way. What we're trying to do is get great attraction with consumers. Uh, but it will go uh, much more in depth in relation to being much more of a, um, I'm trying to think of the right word now, um, I'll come back to it, but uh, you know, a, a in a box on a desk physician type uh, analytical tool. Um, I'm trying to think, what's the Star Trek term for it? The tricorder. Tricorder. Um, it's kind of a mini tricorder. Uh, that's that's his destination eventually. Which is a competition. There is, yeah, uh, which I think was awarded last year. Um, I forget who won. No, Scanlon did not win it. Uh, it was another another player that won it. Uh, I forget. Scanlon is technically the the, the Joe Average um, tricorder. Uh, that's one of the more successful uh, Kickstarter campaigns. Indigo. Um, Indigo, was it? Okay, Indigo. Um, they've had endless issues of getting it right, so it, it still hasn't launched officially. Um, they ended up modifying a part in it, which meant that all the data was no longer FDA approvable, so it started clinical trials all over again. It's a story I always relate to all the healthcare startup entrepreneurs I work with, in terms of it ain't that simple to get one of the things out in the market. Okay, it's gonna do is European, and it's my little symbol there, just give you flavor that it's not all US, it actually are, there are other inventions. However, the sad story is that he couldn't get funding in Europe, so he's gone to the US, because he's got more funding beyond Indiegogo. But that's the nature of things, sadly. The US is where the money is. And we'll look at it in a minute. Okay. Um, the most powerful biosensing wearable is your phone. So before you all rush out and buy a Fitbit or a Misfit or whatever, if you've got yourself a, uh, an Android 5, 6, or an iPhone um, 6 or 5, um, you've already got all that. It's built on your phone, so don't waste your money. Um, literally, it is the most powerful because we're pretty much all in one in the room. Um, we take it everywhere we go, it's full of the sensors that track um, our everyday and therefore we can end up with information on sleep, activity, lifestyle and habits just from the one phone. And then of course you start tagging onto that the new open source software that Apple's released and you literally have an incredibly powerful biosensing wearable to which you can apply a whole bunch of apps to analyse that data. And that's where it's going. So the watch will only add to that in terms of being able to literally wear it everywhere you go, whether you're asleep or awake. Okay, um, just very quickly on adoption. At the moment, adoption is reasonably low. That's a fairly big number, I know, but it's reasonably low. And reason for it are the number of barriers you've got um, standing in the way that you would expect. Uh, and that's usually the sort of barriers you would expect when you're looking at new technologies. Um, uh, so, such as, for example, um, lack of awareness, um, the data is not valuable. I think someone made the comment earlier on around, well, I collect all this data, but I don't get anything out of it. That is a constant uh, call it, reproach that everybody has for uh, the wearables you can buy at the moment. Uh, but I think, based on what we're seeing with the Apple launch, etc., that we are seeing a massive shift to adoption. People, people are starting to use these things a lot more, be a lot more aware of the possible but also at the same time being able to get a lot more out of that data. Uh, and so I think, I think this is um, Gartner data, but um, it, it basically has a prediction that we'll move to a quadrupling of the value of that market uh, through pretty much uh, you know, a, a massive pickup adoption purchase of wearables going forwards. But I mean wearables in the sense that I was talking to you here, not just a thing to stick on your wrist. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop there. Are there any questions on that?
wearables, by sensing. It's very variable from country to country. Um, so Singapore, which tends to be very gadget savvy and friendly, you see a lot more. Uh, in the UK, I was surprised at how low penetration was at this stage. It's still seen as a gimmick. So it's um, still like 10 Probably less than that, to be honest, with the population, yeah. Probably less. Yeah, because most of what we can buy at the moment is that stuff on your wrist. Uh, the other stuff I talked about is literally trying to come to the market now, like Athos and so on. Yeah. How much is it limited in terms of the scope? So for instance, in terms of like the biological Some of the what? Why we got that? Like the biological relevance, right? So the things that you can actually measure and whether what you're measuring actually relates to something new. Like how 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 much is it caught up? So the, uh, I think if I answer your question, I think your, the, the limitation, the handbrake at the moment to this it, is twofold. One is the sensors uh, to be small enough to be able to place in a device that doesn't get in the way of your everyday life. The other is battery life. These things run out of batteries very quickly. So until we figure out how to put longer batteries in smaller spaces, we're going to continue to see some very limited uh, usage of some of these things. Yeah, I guess that's still the tech side yeah. of it, right? So like, what I'm saying is that the biological side of it, right? Because you're using sensors to detect stuff, which means it's either already a known sensor for certain readouts, like you know, glucose or salt or mm -hmm. electrolytes, right? But beyond that, you know, that's, that's just you know, acceleration Right, but beyond that, for like diseases or tracking or other. Well, where 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 science understands a disease, mm -hmm. there's not really much limitation um, beyond the hardware being usable. Let's say uh, where science doesn't understand a disease, of course, there's a great deal more research needs to take place before there's any useful application of a sensor. Um, the biggest handbrake is the adoption of the behavior, really. Um, but in terms of biology. Um, you know, it's really the miniaturization of stuff that already exists in, in, a, in a hospital or doc, uh, doctor's surgery um, in terms of being able to measure stuff. Yeah, and in fact, like MC10, for example, with the external onset, you can start measuring some parameters in the blood. You know, it kind of changes the paradigm because of the depth of what you can like. I think this would start to improve now. Yeah, it's a good example of how miniaturization is coming into play. But it's not ready for launch that yet, so it's still doing trials. Okay, healthcare landscape is shifting as a result of this. Um, what I mean by that, I'm talking about the big industrial players, the big med techs, the GSKs, the Sanofis of this world, etc. Um, just largely because uh, you know spending is inefficient or non-existent, depending on whether you're dealing with Myanmar, or whether we're dealing with the US. No. Um, policies are changing. Uh, to reflect all of this, um, most mature markets can't afford their healthcare bill anymore. Um, there's an increasing focus now on outcome rather than just, you know, doing tests. Um, new business models are therefore starting to take shape to actually change this, which we talked about a bit earlier on at the beginning of this, uh, these slides. And then I talked to you about the, um, the number of new entrants in healthcare from other industries that are coming through. Um, some examples, I won't dive too much, but I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye on a couple there. So health insurance is changing radically in terms of the way in which it is being administered, consumed and administered. And we talked about it a little bit earlier on. Um, in the US, there's a big player called Keys, uh, a very large IPO last year. Uh, in Asia, we got our own, it's called Connection Asia. Um, very successful lady, ex Mercer, uh, has launched a, a business. Uh, closed Series A funding this year, $8 million raised from three or four VCs. Um, so that's quite a powerful one. Um, in um, electronic health records, talked about practice fusion earlier on. Um, there's a little Singapore company called Our Healthmate, does something similar. Um, Practo, various others as well. Um, but just to let you know, it's time to give you a flavor of the fact that Asia is not being left behind, it's doing its own, its own thing as well. Um, just looking at business models very quickly, what I was trying to do there is just to help you understand where we're seeing traction on the B2B model, so business to business model versus the business to consumer model. Um, what's interesting to see is that generally most of the 
uh, business models we're seeing. So I'm not talking about wearable devices anymore. I'm talking about businesses as a whole that are dealing with digital medical information and trying to make a business out of it. Um, they're seeing greatly more traction with business to business applications. Um, the consumer is generally very fickle. If you look at the adoption of Fitbit, for example, generally you know, that was a, a spike usage for about two, three months, and it starts dropping right off. So unless you find you know, a reason to actually get, get the owner to re-engage their Fitbit, tend, the end of that curve tends to be the Fitbit gets passed in the drawer and never used again. Um, so uh, there's still some way to go before we start seeing a valuable, uh, consistent, sustainable revenue model from consumer uh, digital health. Uh, so most of the stuff that we use is free. Not making any money for anyone. Um, however, on the business to business, we're starting to see a great deal more. So, some of these things I showed you earlier on, Practice Fusion, for example, Proteus, um, are making a lot of their money largely because they're selling a service to the industry as a whole. So, Proteus is selling it to large drug firms for um, post launch uh, data for drugs. Um, this is my cheeky little go at the industry. Um, I call it rebooting the life science industry. I talked about uh, clinical trial data and how that was changing now that everybody's got a phone in their hand. Um, just really quickly talk about pharmacogenomics to give you a flavor. Um, most drug firms design a drug by finding a molecule entity um, that looks exciting and then try and apply it to various diseases until they find a connection between the two and they end up with a potential product to then take down the trial phase. Um, it's a bit hit and miss, and usually there's a whole industry now of um, screening um, agencies. You give them the molecule, they go screening an entire database to work out what it applies to. Um, but as you can see, it's a bit hit and miss. You know, you could end up a few weeks down the road finding that molecule doesn't actually do anything, and it gets parked, and you go on to the next molecule, etc. Um, and so you end up with uh, with products that um, a lot of good ideas that don't make it through, um, and so you end up with with some of these uh, products only been applicable to some people as other people. Uh, to give an example, the most common treatment for diabetes is metformin. Um, I think it's something like between 20 and 30 percent, percent of patients to whom metformin is prescribed have absolutely no effect on them at all. Because it's not designed for them. They're not the right genotype for that particular product. So where we're seeing a big change in drug design is the example I gave you of 23andMe doing a deal with Roche. What Roche is doing is, is using the data to understand the particular profile of a patient with a specific disease, and then to understand what protein is broken in the DNA chain of that patient. They then work out what drug, effectively, what molecule, needs to be administered to actually change that protein defect and correct it. So it's much more precise. We're starting to see that coming through on some new drugs, generally under the oncology drugs, generally under the heading of immunotherapy, where it's targeting the cancerous cell directly, rather than the usual chemotherapy approach, which carpet bombs the entire body. Um, but that's where drug research is going. So, um, give you an example. In the UK, 23 and me I talked about earlier on with Roche and Pfizer doing a deal. So Roche did a deal that was no price to be disclosed, but Roche and Genentech did a 60 million deal with 23andMe. In the UK, NHS, which is the National Health Service, um, has a thing called uh, Genome England, which is a new uh, database they've created, where the uh, 100,000 patients with a rare disease have uh, been uploaded into it. And these guys, among 12 others, I think, yeah, I think it's 12 others, but anyway, these guys are leveraging this data on a pro bono basis to understand how they can define better treatments for the patients that have a rare disease. At the moment, there is no treatment. So they're using their genome sequencing to understand what protein needs to be dealt with and how they actually try and correct that protein. So you can see in your heads, no doubt, the radical change in R&B going on at the moment from, you know, pretty much an average approach to very precise targeting of the disease. That's why Clayton Christensen is referred to the precision medicine phenomenon. Because it's now going to be about you rather than the other 10,000 people who may look like you. Yep. 
Uh, clinical data I talked about very quickly, so I won't uh, spend too much time on that, but it gives you a fl flavor of um, how that's changing. I just wanted to quote this example. Most countries with a central payor, such as the government, will um, go take a drug firm through an, an approval process to get reimbursed. Um, now, in the past, that used to be quite easy because it was all about finding a solution, but now, of course, it's getting harder and harder because government, a government can't necessarily afford the treatment. Uh, how many of you, if anybody, followed the Gilead saga of the last year? They released a revolutionary product for hepatitis C, but it's $1,000 a pill. So the cost is exorbitant. Um, and, but people have obviously been prescribed it because it's a miraculous drug. Uh, but it's woken up people to the fact that you know, it's more about outcome than it has to be about treatment. And so this example here is quite interesting where J&J tried to get approval in the UK for a drug that was treatment on average of $35,000 per annum. Initially, we're told they weren't going to get approval because the government of the UK, which has an agency that obsesses this stuff, said, we can't see sufficient benefit in this product, therefore we're not going to reimburse it. Um, what J&J said is they said we're not going to charge the patients until they've actually seen a benefit. So that got it approved immediately because, okay, we'll only pay when there's a benefit. Um, so what's interesting is that the data you're starting to collect from some of these applications that are sitting on your phone is starting to create that data that, that demonstrates benefit on a sample of millions of people at a time rather than a few thousand at a time. Um, so the examples here are Healing is a Singapore-based company, Rika is a Singapore-based company, this one I've talked about already, this is a research kit. Um, but we're starting to see some interesting mid-sized companies coming out of Singapore um, that are actually deriving quite a decent business model from that new phenomenon going on in the clinical trials. Okay, any questions on that? I'll try to sort of touch on how it's changing industry. We can talk about insurance, talk about that later on, for example. Um, but it's changing a whole bunch of things. Yep. Okay, funding. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few points there in relation to funding. Give you a flavor of um, what's happening because that gives you a, an indicator of where investors think uh, you know, things are happening in terms of trends and therefore how you can improve that. Um, so there's certainly some themes coming out of it, which I'll talk about in two seconds. Um, venture capital in, 20, in 2014 doubled what it was invested in 2013, which doubled what was invested in 2011. So in terms of venture funding in healthcare, it's the fastest growing area of healthcare getting money at the moment. Way more than biotech and way more than medtech. Um, so growing number of technology to investors, um, which means that basically you're starting to see Google moving in, Apple's moving in, and of course big pharma companies and big medtech companies are too. Um, Large number of M&A deals. Um, we're starting to see some of the big players acquiring the little startups. Um, and um, just to give you a flavour, last count, and uh, seven thousand, sorry, there's seven and a half thousand digital health startups around the world. That's just startups. So it's a big ecosystem. Um, so that's the trend. So you see digital health dwarfing the other two, and certainly dwarfing funding as a whole in VC. That's a trend year on year. Right. 14, double, 13, double in uh, 10, sorry. There's some key trends. You see analytics and big data. Gone from there to there to now number one. Healthcare consumer engagement, so what you and I use on a day to day basis. Number one, number one, number one is now number two. The fastest growing area at the moment is telemedicine. Be able to reach your doctor from remote without having to go and visit he or she in their surgery, for example. I'll skip that. That's too small for you to read, but I just wanted to show you the number of M&A deals in, in digital health, yeah? Worth about 20 billion. Some big names there. You've got Becca Dickinson, Medtronic, AstraZeneca, uh, Weight Watchers, and here you've got Facebook, so you've got all sorts of deals going on with the big guys coming into the digital health space. Just give you a flavor. Um, Roche did a deal a couple of weeks ago as well. So they're all coming into play. Which is that consolidation I was talking to you about at the beginning and that big map of startups, big change. Um, it's taken a while. I was wondering would they ever wake up when I was in the industry, but certainly starting to see a major wake up. 
I know your company is uh, waking up as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, Asia. Let me, I'll just give you a quick flavor of Asia. I talked about that briefly. So 199, 200 startups that I last counted. Um, and then just give you an idea of trends in terms of where the bulk of them are. Versus, so big data is quite small at the moment. Um, in Asia, that is, but consumer health and wellness, in other words, apps that you and I can download and use, quite a few Asian startups in that space. And some very big deals. This is millions of dollars invested, and the, the stage in which they were invested, and who. Right. There's Singapore, 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 and Singapore again. So, India, China, and Singapore are pretty much the growth zones for digital health startup funding. In China and India, it's a massive business case, 1.3 billion people. Uh, in Singapore, it's um, the principal driver, I think, is the regulatory uh, intellectual property and the legal framework that's making it much more friendly to startups to come here rather than sitting in Vietnam or Indonesia, for example. Probably stop there. I mean, there's loads more information, but I'm conscious it's 20 past four. Um, anything that makes sense? Any questions? I think earlier on you mentioned about like, this company and Singapore startup um, doing uh, electronic health records. Yeah. But the thing is, for a, for you to even collect data on electronic health records, right, the hospitals must be willing to open up their EMR systems, right? So, I mean, so this is something that has to involve all the institutions, let's say within Singapore, both public and private. So how, how do all these companies try to navigate this space? <coughs> so they largely provide for free. Sorry? They largely provide the software for free. Uh -huh. So that's the attraction for the clinic. Uh -huh. uh, they will take the software for free and use it. Uh -huh. uh, and then of course the startup works out different ways of monetizing that. Singapore's a peculiar case. The government is rolling out a uh, platform for all uh, medical centers, hospitals, doctors, etc., to actually electronify their health records. Uh -huh. Um, I think Accenture is the consulting firm that's actually doing the top technology for them. Um, I think they're on something like 30% of all physicians I have now digitized their patient records. Uh, so I think, broadly speaking, MOH will tell you that it's going well. I think people will tell you it's going slowly, but it's happening. Uh, the US has got something similar going on at the moment as well. So there is a bit of push and pull going on. Uh, so the private sector is giving things free to actually be able to do other things with it, but the government is starting to take a, a broader interest and try and you know be much more efficient in terms of the way healthcare is administered yeah. by getting better insights into data. Yeah. So if the government is really throwing out an electronic health record system, then how will these um, startups compete against what the government is like? <coughs> Um, well, there are two ways of looking at it. One, uh, so our health makers are doing a fair bit of business outside of Singapore. They're based here, but they're doing business outside of Singapore where there aren't the governments doing those particular um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, options. Um, and in Singapore, uh, the government system is pretty much a, a, a repository of information. Uh, so it gives you the, the key areas of information in terms of database. It doesn't really do too many, too many analytics and data diagnostic support. That's where you're starting to see them move into in terms of what's the value add beyond on, that you can derive from that data to help you know, clinics result be more efficient. So when a patient comes in, how do you triage that patient more rapidly to major case to doctor, minor case to nurse, for example? Yeah. Sorry? The data? Uh, at the moment, it's your physician only. And the Singapore is owned by the physician. Overseas, is it owned by the patient or the physician? Physician still. Physician. Also physician. Yeah, it's a cultural thing. In most uh, Asian countries, uh -huh. the doctor's king. So. Yeah, I mean in Asia and Singapore, but what about, let's say, in the EU or in the US? Um, it's still very much held, held by the healthcare um, organization to which you've, you're aligned to or connected to. Um, so essentially, your physician is the only person that has access to that data. Uh, it, you should have access as an individual, which is your data, but you don't actually have access at this stage. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things that needs to change over time. In Singapore currently, who owns my data, for example? 
Um, your physician. I mean, I don't know that for uh, in terms of a legal perspective, but certainly in terms of who's accountable for it, then your physician is. Yeah. PDPA kind of starting to move towards the patient coming to data. Trying to. The, the mechanism is still not. Is yeah. Pretty well, in, in large, the patient's not ready. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be a while before that actually becomes available to you. Yeah, because there's a lot of these startups are about selling, not sort of selling data, but using the data for value free to another company to do analytics. So I don't see there's any regards to who owns it. Uh, well, a lot of that data you're talking about is completely anonymized anyway, but still and aggregated. So, so once it gets anonymized, it's it's okay for them to keep up. No, 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 no. It's a very yeah. it's certainly Singapore and the UK, for example, the US too. I think there's some very strict uh, protocols to who can access and how, etc. Um, but that's we're talking about your medical data held by your physician or your hospital. It's a different story to Fitbit data. Fitbit is selling your data to every marketing company, analytics company you can possibly get their money. One day will be they will become one. Uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be that linchpin. After you will be starting to bring it together in one place. So theoretically, you'll be the only person that has the ability of all of those data points in one place. Well, a while away from that, but I'm just painting a picture of where it's going, where I think it's going. So. What are the remaining hard and solved problems. So this is what people are addressing right now, but I don't quite have a sense of what a, okay, let's say I want to get into the space, where are the largest unsolved problems? <laughs> yeah. um, if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be telling you. <laughs> um, oh, no, the unmet medical need in Asia is massive. Um, so the US is dealing with one problem, which is how they reduce their costs, is what you're seeing. In Asia, it's, it's, it's all sorts of things. It's starting with how do you create awareness population that there is a diabetic issue and it will change your lifestyle. Uh, so there are some massive amount of medical needs, which are obvious. The challenge is how do you actually affect change? That's the hard thing. I think when you mention lifestyle, I mean, um, there's two parts of the equation, right? One's the food, and yep. one's the um, physical activity. So I see, I think the wearables kind of covered it in the physical activity side, but um, maybe the food is not so much an, an Asia, we love more food. Yeah. And, there. Well, definitely, without that. The challenge with technology and food at the moment, but it's really hard for the technology to look at your food and say, hey, that's what's in there. That's, it's changing. There's some couple of interesting devices out there that are actually seem to be able to do that better. But at the moment, it requires you to enter the information yourself, which is a pain. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I gave up doing that after about a week. I just got fed up with typing every single thing I was consuming into my phone. <laughs> um, and so immediately the diet thing fell out of the equation. So it told me how many calories I was burning, but it wasn't telling me how many calories I was consuming at the time. And if a diabetic is useless, calories don't make any difference, it's about carbs, so it gets even more complicated. Um, lifestyle is a bit broader than that, it's more than just activity. So if you're a taxi driver and all you do is sit behind a car, a steering wheel, that is an issue to your lifestyle. Uh, you know, theoretically, a taxi driver should stop every hour and walk around the block. Uh, they don't, obviously, you know, if they stop, they stand a cigarette. Um, but that is, you know, a massive impact on our individual lifestyle. Um, given the role of state in healthcare, do you actually see any governments uh, having an interest in this or apart from your example of the NHS, yeah. kind of getting their, their feet wet, like mm -hmm. working their hands and everything? So every government's looking at it very closely. Um, they um, are looking at it carefully because it's obviously um, understanding first what you can make a difference in versus what private enterprise can make a difference in, it's all taxpayer money. Um, they're looking at it from a perspective of um, what can they borrow from somewhere else rather than invent themselves. Um, there is obviously all the legal regulatory side they need to address. Um, in some countries like the UK or Europe generally, there's a whole data privacy challenge they need to get over. Uh, getting people comfortable with the fact that actually for their benefit rather than Big Brother, looking at their health records, for example. Um, so, it's classic government, it's moving slowly. Uh, Singapore government is certainly one of the more um, I don't know, proactive, let's say, precocious, you want to call it, uh, governments out there in terms of what they're looking at. Um, the UK is doing a reasonable job. Obama's on record in the US is saying this is where we're going. Um, so, yeah, quite a lot. Uh, it is actually going on at government level. Um, 
regulations, you know, this was all in there, but there's a lot of information there for you. Um, government is going to have to play a massive role in this. Um, and so you've got a huge difference between the OECD government that's trying to find ways of being more efficient, and you've got the developing market trying to find ways of delivering better health care because of you know, substantial underinvestment for many years. Uh, reactive. Um, I wouldn't even call them reactive at the moment. I think I know a lot of them are watching to uh, figure out what they do um, and trading forward where they think they can get um, traction. A lot of this, and I think someone dealt with it earlier on, for example, is why we're not seeing change in the government. Why is <coughs> wellness is not? Um, you got to remember that government's decision makers are politicians. Politicians are elected for a short period of time, and so a lot of decisions that should be taken, but actually don't affect what's happening now in their term, won't be taken necessarily because it'll be someone else's advantage, not mine. So you've got a short-termism that's also, also you know, standing in the way of getting some real strategic policies taking place. Um, but it's an interesting, healthy tension between industry, government, etc., in terms of trying to push that agenda. What are some, uh, let's say, negative implications that you guys perceive around these areas? I mean, in terms of, uh, let's say, you know, uh, more data becoming available, like you, if you're, let's say, uh, you're making the wrong choices, like you're unhealthy, do you have to divulge that uh, in terms of business activities? Uh, um, negative, I mean, there, there are risks to all this, if that's what I'm referring to, so, you know, data privacy right. is one, um, you know, how, how will employers deal with the information they've got? Um, how will insurers deal with the information they've got? Could insurers actually have access to that data? Um, the worried web, you know, how many hypochondriacs are going to create out of this? Um, so there's a lot of risk to it, without doubt. Um, but you know, we've got to be careful we don't let the risk get in the way of what is essentially a radical change to healthcare and a benefit to all of us in the long term. And there will be teething issues. You know, there will be data hacks. There was a massive one in the US last year, and a big insurance company got hacked into. Uh, it, they hadn't encrypted any data record, so of course they got, they got hacked into. Um, so we'll all have to learn. Um, but, you know, data privacy, it's a myth, guys. Anyone who's using Google or LinkedIn or Facebook, you said goodbye to your privacy a long time ago. Uh, what, what about, uh, so everybody started more or small. Now you guys have talked about the rising cost of uh, developing drugs. I think they actually call it E-Rules Law because the, it's the opposite of uh, more for basically the cost of developing drugs is going higher and higher. So is it going to be that you know, if you're wealthy and, and so forth, you can afford the best drugs, whereas if you're poor and you know, living in bad conditions, you have to be sick screwed. Is that going to happen? No, but I think, if, I mean, like in any innovation, there's a barrier to entry, which means that wealthier people will be able to afford it before uh, less well advantaged people. Um, but you need a certain amount of that to be able to create the volume or the industrialization of that particular technology to be able to bring its price point down. Uh, so like any, any innovation really, generally it's the people who are well off who get the benefit first, they eventually it trickles down to the rest of the, rest of, uh, of the population, the bottom of the pyramid. Um, you know, it's up to NGOs, governments, you know, those kind of stakeholders to try and um, expedite the reduction of price point. So one of the interesting phenomena we're seeing at the moment is what I would broadly call frugal innovation. Um, so the example of, of this thing, for example, you know, suddenly now Apollo Hospitals is, allowed, is in a position to do single channel ECG with any single patient in India um, for the price of 125 bucks. Well, includes the phone, it doesn't include the phone, sorry, but most doctors have got a Samsung phone anyway. Um, so it's, get, you know, it's not, it's not creating necessarily creating a prohibitive price point. Uh, it actually, you could see the benefit the other way in relation to the technology allowing a much lower price point for the delivery of healthcare. Um, and therefore, you know, rural villages, etc., be able to afford some of the technology. Tom does some work with an Indian company for doing a prenatal scanner. Uh, India and Indonesia have missed their millennium development goals for infant mortality year on year and year on year after year. On year. And two reasons for that, or key drivers for that. One is newborn, when they go back home, mum is busy doing cleaning, 
washing, food cooking, and handling the newborn baby. So you can see the disease traffic in the, in the house. Um, Unilever has been very successful in trying to reduce that sanitation issue by, for example, reducing the size of the, of the soap bar from a rather large, expensive one to actually a small one they can afford every day because cash flow is a major issue for a lot of farmers, for example. And creating awareness through telephone, SMS campaigns, radio campaigns, etc. So it's been really successful. Another one, of course, is the fact that there aren't enough OBS gynae in India. And so uh, a mother will generally end up in the rural area giving birth without an even OBS gynae being available. Uh, and usually it's a midwife who's half qualified or not qualified. Um, so if it's a straightforward birth, it's not an issue. It happens. But the minute it gets complicated, you know, in breach and those kind of things, um, you need some tools to be able to define whether it's time to, you know, to, uh, do the inception. Um, and some of those tools are either prohibitively expensive or require quite a lot of level of training to be able to use them. Um, so this particular start I'm working with is defined to devise a device that actually works with a, a phone. Uh, and so not only do they reduce the price point completely in terms of being able to do the prenatal scan, so that every, pretty much every single village can afford one, but at the same time the data is interpreting on a screen on a phone that a, a nurse or a half, um, what they call them, Again, now the uh, yeah, the other name, the, um, it'll come back to me. Um, could look at the screen and, and define whether it's green or red as to whether there's a risk here, and therefore, do they need to then go into the telemedicine mode and talk to the opt guy back in Delhi? Because um, if you ask the Delhi opt guy to come to your village, it's highly unlikely they'll come, or it'll be three weeks' time from now, which of course is far too late. I'll just give you an example of where it's not necessarily prohibitively expensive, it's actually reducing the price point. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot.